dear students we will wait for a uh, few minutes before we start let us start okay we will start with the uh, the new uh, part of uh, this chapter that is the end of this chapter basically advantages and disadvantages so before uh, we get into that uh, area uh, let us understand uh, whether there was any difficulty uh, in writing the summary of or the previous assignment Let's start with the uh, Ria Sara. Oh, no, sir. Uh, you could able to get the, the article. Yes, sir, I did get an article. Okay, good. Ashwin Soni. Uh, put it in the chat box. I am not able to hear it. Lakshmi. Yes, sir. Any problem? No problem, sir. Okay. Kesia? No problem, sir. Priya Pillai? Priya Pillai? No problem, sir. Okay. Uh, Ashwin Soni is saying that uh, he, he, he did not got the article. Ashwin, what you can do is that um, you can uh, get it from others. See, the people who have already got a research article, please uh, share with uh, Ashwin uh, Sony. Okay? Is it okay, Sony? Then you can uh, have it and then write it and submit, upload it. Okay? Navindran. Sir, no problem, sir. Okay, and Maria? No problem, sir. Mega? 
Sir, I got an article, but I'm not sure whether it is right or not. Oh, send it to me, to my WhatsApp. I will confirm it. Okay, sir. Okay. Otherwise, also, if you're not very sure, you can take it from other people also. That is always welcome. But I okay, I encourage your uh, uh, article which you have already collected. Send it to my WhatsApp. Okay. Okay, sir. Benzir. No problem, sir. Okay. Atira James. No problem, sir. Sai Trileka. No problem, sir. Jiarli. Jiarli. Akpina. No problem, sir. Sharin Babu. No problem, sir. Marlin Sara. No problem, sir. Tenzin. No problem, sir. Aydin Sara. No problem, sir. Okay. Uh, Manoj. No problem, sir. Uh, Nikita. No problem, sir. Aparna. No problem, sir. Amal. Amal. No problem. Okay. Kezia. Uh, uh, Kezia Rachel, I guess. Ah, Kezia Rachel. No problem, sir. Aswin. Aji. No problem, sir. Okay, so good. Uh, you people do not have any problem so far. So let us uh, go, uh, go to the last part of this uh, chapter and uh, understand what it is. Okay. Advantages of pharmacoepidemiological methods. Like you can say that it is the compilation of the advantages basically of all the methods and uh, uh, in what way the, the methods can be useful in the research and also for the um, in improvement of healthcare system. Right. First one is that it helps in the examination of drug use in elderly, pediatrics, pregnant, and patient with concomitant diseases. See, usually the clinical trials do not include these patients as these group of patients. They do not because there may be a variation in the uh, results that is therapeutic benefits or therapeutic ad adverse consequences so as a result pharmacoepidemiology is the only method where you can understand the drug use and its effect in different types of population elderly pediatrics pregnant women as well as patients with concomitant diseases. That is, patients suffering from more than one disease. They, like for example, patients having two diseases, patients having three diseases, such, such kind of uh, 
uh, problems. The next advantage is that it helps to study the effect of drugs on people over a period of time. See, uh, pharmacoepidemiological study, as we all know, that it is uh, a, it is an observational study. You can keep on observing the patient who is taking a particular medicine, say medicine number N for the duration he or she takes. You don't have to intervene, you don't have to do any manipulation in the dosage just by observing the outcome of the drug effect in this population for over a period of time. We can get lots of information with respect to benefits as well as side effects. Okay. So getting the data on side effect is a very important concept because it ensures the safety of the medicines. Okay, so that is about the uh, effect of drugs in people over a time. The third advantage of uh, these methods are that steady use of drugs on daily basis. Yeah, you can study it on daily basis. The clinical trials and all they have a schedules but it is not like that since it is an observational daily you can go to the hospital i mean hospital bedside then start collecting the patient patient details or the outcome details on a daily basis as long as the patient is there in the uh, hospital such kind of provision is not available with any other uh, methods Next is that study the effect of uh, effects of concomitant drugs due to medication adherence. Say on one side we say that you have to stick to medicines. On the other side, patient will be taking two drugs together or one drug or maybe three drugs together over a period of time as per the advice of physician. Correct. So, we already know that drugs can interact with each other and may produce the effect. Such effect will be very good when the, as long as the patient sticks to uh, medication, medications. Now, you can identify the, the therapeutic benefit. You can identify the adverse consequences because of the interaction. And you can also find out any other modification or inactiveness because of the administration of two drugs. So all the three benefits can be observed uh, with the drugs which are concomitantly used. Such kind of situation you cannot see during the conduction of clinical trials, basically. Because in clinical trials, only one drug, one dosage, group of patients will be there. But here, there's a lot of flexibility to uh, understand the effect of drugs in two or three. These studies help in getting the information which may be uh, therapeutic beneficial or which may be therapeutic ad adverse consequences. The information on adverse consequences helps to alert clinicians, manufacturers, as well as regulators about the potential problems associated with the drug use. This is very important. If it, how it is going to be useful for the clinician, if you alert the physician that this drug is going to produce this effect, clinician will be careful enough to prescribe the medicine next time. Number one. Second thing is that if he encounters the adverse consequences, he, he knows how to manage it. Okay. So, and also he, he knows how to reduce the dosage of the drug initially until the patient is adjusted to the effect of the drug. So th that way, clinicians get lots of benefits. How do, do, how do uh, manufacturers get the benefit from this 
can anybody tell how the manufacturers will get the benefit amal jishnu no sir i don't know anju varki any idea no, any idea no, amal jishnu sorry uh, ayan maria any idea aparna sir in post marketing surveillance uh, phase uh, the manufacturers can get whether the drug has caused any adverse effect or not okay but what is the use for them suppose for example you are a clinical pharmacist and you have identified an adverse effect which is new and associated with the new drug and you have given this information to manufacturer so what is the advantage for the manufacturer this is what my question is uh, either they can modify the drug or yes. uh, they can uh, yeah. they can uh, uh, instruct the uh, uh, in leaflets they can give the instructions as such correct yeah either they can modify the drug or switch over to the drug but that it is going to be a very loss for the for them uh, but they can modify or they can insert or i mean they can change the product label information so you can they can mention that uh, this particular drug likely to cause this particular effect so caution is required so such kind of product information modification can be done by the manufacturer if the new information is given to them regulators can anybody tell uh, how the regulators are going to be benefited from this or alertness aquina don't know sir okay anju varki Atira James. So the, they'll get the information and they can report it uh, to the clinic clinicians and everyone. Yes. So, so regulators can have, can instruct the manufacturers on one side. They can inform the clinicians through product literature as, as a government notifications, so that uh, clinicians become alert enough. to use the drug about the potential problems with the potential problems so can we move on to the next slide everybody is clear with this points yes sir yeah. it acts as a signal generator it acts as a signal generator to direct for the research see we have seen that case reports case series report that one report can generate a indication or a signal so that you can further study in detail in order to know the uh, consequences in order to know the consequences okay so that is the benefit so you don't get this benefit in clinical trials because there is no, there is nothing like case report in clinical trials it is actually well designed studies so this is only flexible method to get a signal about the either therapeutic benefit or it can be adverse effect but it will definitely allow you to direct further research to take it up in full fledged manner so that the the amount of data available will be large enough to use the drug confidently so that is the advantage next ad advantage is that these methods can give new ideas to explore uh, the drug use as well as the effects okay see like we have a uh, case reports and uh, case series report we have a group cohort studies you have a case cohort studies and all those things 
when you are trying to do such kind of studies you will get a idea okay uh, let me uh, assess the drug uh, at this particular dosage or maybe let me uh, intervene during the use of the drug so that final outcome can change so it it gives a kind of idea for you to intervene at uh, when the patient is taking the drug and also plan uh, healthcare uh, treatment in a manner where the patient can get benefit okay, for example i'll give you a simple example when the drug is known to have a sedative effect during the research so what would be the time of administration which you can think of you can think of uh, giving the same drug with a sedation a sleeping effect at the night time so that you know patient also sleeps nicely as well as benefit also will be maximum so this is the new idea which you are going to get it by finding out the effect and we know that you're going to find out in qualitative study drug use pattern right prescribing pattern so you can find out what is the prescribing pattern between two areas or between two metro cities or between two states or between two countries for the uh, for a single disease if you would like to know what is the way of treatment of uh, say for example uh, um, you know hypothyroidism in india as well as in uh, pakistan or in india or as well as america then you can see the drug use pattern the way they treat the drug also treat the problem also will vary so that is the benefit actually it also helps to monitor the drug use by the healthcare providers health authorities and regulators of the clinical practice see monitoring drug use is very very important otherwise uh, there will be a biasness in the use of the drug for example manufacturer will be introducing the product to the uh, clinician okay and clinician start pre prescribing it and start making the money out of it if you don't and uh, whenever there is a problem and uh, they may not report it but if somebody is trying to regulate such kind of use or improper usage then this kind of lapse will not occur that is why in hospital setup then they, they, there will be a authorities in order to uh, in order to what you say in, uh, monitor the drug use otherwise uh the doctors will be using in their own way and it is not as per the therapeutic guidelines and patients health at is at risk is at risk so that is why pharmacoepidemiological methods since they are observation in nature they help to monitor the drug use by healthcare providers or health authorities or regulators and it gives a great deal of flexibility in connection to use the data from variety of resources such as patient records patient interviews and computer database so like in clinical trials what happens is that everything is done systematically yes in phase 1 this is what happened in phase 2 this is what happened here it is not like that you can get the in data you can get the data in a database using the patient all patient details or one database and you can administer a questionnaire sitting in a different place and you can enter the data in different place and in another place one can enter the details about the drug in a different database and you can combine all those databases right if you combine all the databases you will be able to, able to identify the outcome so one need not have to be there together always so that is the advantage of this pharmacoepidemiological study right so uh, you know it offers a great flexibility not like a very rigid way like the way you can see in uh, you know during the clinical trials so that is the um, i know uh, advantage on message is there chart is there let us see what is the chart okay 
so that's about uh, this particular advantages um, let us let, let us move on to disadvantages of pharmacopoeiopediological methods so the disadvantages will be will likely to be more because of its flexibility wherever the methods are flexible there is a disadvantage problem also what, let us see what are those disadvantages these studies are non experimental that is the disadvantage you go to the patient observe whether the patient is taking or not or observe how the drugs are getting prescribed so it is non experimental in nature so what happens is that the results what you see will not be you cannot think you cannot be 100% confident that yes this is this result is because of this drug only or sometimes you may say that the, any variation can be calculated but in this case any variation here and there usually it is very difficult to calculate it 100% result cannot be given but at least given a chance 90% of the results can be in limit and they tend to be correlational correlational so like for example you have used a drug use pattern in for example a prescribing pattern in one city metro city you want to compare the uh, compare the uh, prescribing pattern in another city only you have a data to compare it but actually you did not try understanding why the prescribing pattern is changed in two locations you can say that prescribing pattern in one city is like this another city is like this whether they are related whether not related this only we can uh, conclude it but not there may be a summer of the reason in another city for the change in the drug so these studies do not offer you to understand step by step with every drug because they are observational in nature so these are non experimental that is why so as well as correlation in nature so what happens is that causation is difficult to establish you cannot say 100% confidently that the second effect is produced because of the first drug that's the thing there can be a chance for biasness and confounding variables confounding variables which threatens the validity or the correctness of the data which you have collected there is a there may be a bias so confounding variables you know that smoking drinking and all those and such information you may not get it properly here unless and until you regulate it in one particular place so they may likely to cause the uh, you know changes in the final uh, data so the biasness which is possible in pharmacopoeiopediological studies are categorized into three types selection bias information bias and confounding bias right let us understand what is this selection bias selection bias is related to the recruitment of study patients or last to follow up so you may uh, recruit a patient saying that based on his report only you did not check you don't check anything but whatever he has reported you believed and uh, you know uh, recruited him or her into your study so what happens what happens sometimes if the patient is an alcoholic or a smoker or habituated to other drug sometime and he did not told you then you made a mistake huh? enrolling the patient so that is known as selection bias you you might have enrolled and started studying the drug effect through follow up after two follow up third follow up the patient may not turn so you lose the 
data of that. But you will write the data based on the earlier two consequences. So manipulation of the data can be a possible that leads to selection bias. Information bias. It is it relates to accuracy of the data collected. This is what you know information. When the patient is giving the information, if he or she lies with you, then that data is under danger. That is the bias thought. That is called as information bias. Probably you, as a researcher, you will be hundred percent correct in giving the information, but when you want to get the information from that, they may lie or they may tell the answer which is not true. That may lead to information bias. Next one is confounding bias. Confounding bias in this case, uh, it refers to correlative factors that make the ca causation by the drug being investigated as unclear. Correlative factor. That's what I would try. We, we were trying to understand that. Uh, prescribing pattern one city you're trying to compare with the other city and you're going to correlate it whether this is correlating or not so it is only correlative factor actually something is not done so this leads to uh, you know a kind of biasness known as confounding bias next one is there may be a confounding by indication whereby patients are selected because of severity of the illness and then observed to have higher rate of specific outcome than comparison group. These studies makes it impossible to know whether the difference was due to treatment of the disease. See, what is the meaning of this is, 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 is that, see, um, let us say that, um, you, you are trying to observe the effect of antidepressants. So your goal is to administer the uh, depression scale uh, to patient and see whether the depression score is getting reduced gradually or not. Okay. So what you are expected to do is that you are expected to recruit the patient who is having severe or very severe depression. No, sorry. You are expected to enroll uh, depression patients, correct? Diagnosis is depression, major, uh, sorry, uh, major depressive disorder. That is the diagnosis. You are supposed to enroll the patient into the study. Now, when you are enrolling, the problem comes, what severity with which the patient is suffering from, I should enroll whether i should enroll mild patients mildly severe patients whether i have to enroll moderately severe patients or whether i have to enroll severely patients or very severely patients this question arises now in this question what happens okay you have study you have set the study criteria saying that severe patients now you have enrolled them now, severity of the depression range, ranges across the score. Say, for example, uh, severe depression score according to Hamilton scale ranges from 18 to 22 score. Now, there is a four digits difference in the severity of the depression. If you want to call anybody as a severely depressed, the score should lie from 18 to 22 in Hamilton depression scale, rating scale. Okay. Now, you have recruited a patient whose uh, rating scale is 18 score, which is on the lower side, and you try to do the study. That person who is having uh, the score of 18 is likely to recover much faster than the patient who, whose score is 21. Correct? Now, you are confused. Is it because the treatment is changing the result or because the patient is trying to respond much faster than the uh, uh, drug treatment, much faster than the expected treatment? 
So such kind of confusion is always possible in this pharmacoepidemiological studies, right? Some models are cohort studies. We know that they require huge sample, large sample is required. So that is why they will become expensive and time consuming because getting the data from large number of patients, it takes some time, right? Recall bias is associated with retrospective studies and retrolective studies. Say recall bias. So if you're trying to do the retrospective studies from the data which is already available in the records, then there may be a retrospective or recall bias will be there. Somebody would have forgotten to write some information. So it leads to recall bias. Retrolective studies means like, you know, the information taken from the database such as PubMed. Some people have uh, do the study, retrospective study by taking information already available from the PubMed as a published report. So all the information is not available. Our information which is available is totally variable actually. So what happens is that there may be a recall bias, right? Any any doubt so far? Anybody has any doubt or any point you could not able to understand? No doubt. Okay. The other disadvantages include incomplete records or missing data area also is a common problem. Like for example, the records, they would not have filled up all the information. So there will be a missing data in some areas of the record. In rare diseases, sample size area often very small with anecdotal information making information uh, you know, making the confirmation of results difficult. See, in rare diseases, uh, see, you cannot conclude so easily with the small data. You need a large data and it is not available also. It takes a lot of time to gather the information and to conclude it uh, confidently. Okay, that's a disadvantage of this pharmacoepidemiological studies. Okay. So that's about that finishes this particular chapter. So today you will not have any, uh, you know, uh, any assignment. So the assignment will be stopped at the last one, and that's it. So if, I, if there is an, if there is no uh, uh, doubt, so these studies are like you know, are of three types to conclude: qualitative, quantitative, meta-analysis. And by other approaches, each method will have its advantages and disadvantages. And the pharmacoepidemiological methods are basically flexible and offer a number of benefits, sometimes also limitations. Okay. So this ends up this particular chapter. Now, uh, in the next class, you will have your class test. I'll forward the notes. Manoj, tell me uh, whether you need the class test in uh, one part, second part, two parts, or three parts.